All right. Um, we're going to pick up, and we're going to try to finish up here, hopefully uh, within the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll try to finish up chapter 21 and 22. Um, I will say that the majority of this is going to be speculation. Um, it is going to be a lot of um, conjecture simply because there are things being discussed, things that are being uh, talked about here in Scripture, a good bit of this, that our minds can't even comprehend. Um, this is eternal stuff. This is um, heavenly stuff. These are... Let's put it like this. These are biblical teasers. These are biblical uh, appetizers. They're just there to wet your whistle and get you salivating over heaven. That's the only thing that I can understand from this is that there's something out there that our minds can't even comprehend. So how do you teach a Bible study on this? Um, we're going to do the best we can. I'm going to try to pick up some things that hopefully will be of, uh, of some form of, of, of value. But if nothing else, I do, I do hope that it lets us realize and remember, continually bring to our uh, remembrance, this world isn't all there is. There is a reality that we can't see. There is a reality that we are longing for. The Bible says that uh, like Abraham who was looking for a country that was a city that was not made by hands. He was looking for something beyond this. His, his earthly journey was... When you think about it, our earthly journey... I, I, got, a, I got a thing the other day. Google sent me something where... We took pictures and it uploads or something on the computer and all that. Then they sent me this, like a timeline of our last year. It was uh, frightfully uh, uneventful. Uh, but even if you are a, a global uh, traveler, how far are we really getting? In all of God's vast creation, most of us will still be confined to this little planet. And you'll never get far enough away from the things in your life that you're not going to come right back to them. Do you see what I'm getting at? That none of it, even, even as vast as this world is, is still just a speck in the grand scheme of God's creation. And if we've got a creative God, if God was so creative as to create the, the known creation and all the laws and um, physical principles, properties that we are aware of now, are we so arrogant as to think that he would have stopped with us? That we are somehow so superior that God wouldn't have other creation. And I do believe that there is something far grander than what we see. I actually was uh, doing some study. There was an individual who, uh, uh, apparently there are several um, physicists and um, astrophysicists, uh, people in the scientific community who are starting to uh, do some calculations with the uh, help of supercomputers and and. Uh, algorithms and things that they're able to come up with now, and they have determined that we are living in a shadow. There, This kind of boggled my mind. I'll throw it out there, take it if you want it. Um, but we're living in a simulation is what they're calling it. Almost like a digital simulation of a grander reality. There's something behind all this that is keeping it going. What we're living in is not, we've, got, we've made this our reality, 
But God never intended for His people to live in this as reality. We're supposed to be passing through this. We're supposed to have our mind set on something above this. Why does the Bible say that we're supposed to seek to have the mind of Christ? Because Christ was not confined here. When we get, our, get a, a broader perspective, when we begin to recognize that there's something bigger than this, not just coming, but is here now, it makes the problems that we deal with now seem very small and trivial indeed. I am convinced that we're, we're completely unaware of the reality that's around us right now. Well, there's the, see, what we do is we have, we have confined demons and angels and heavenly hosts into our reality just not seen. Not seen. We don't see them, but we make it like they're, they're just here on earth and this is where they are. But there is a vaster reality behind the physical that we see. Right. Right. And I know that there are spiritual battles and all of that going on all the time here mm -hmm. in this room even and outside this room and then in the air, in the very air because this thing has full of stuff that we can't even comprehend all the time. I can be stuck like mad out there. But and then you go up higher and higher and higher beyond it has to be beyond what you Whatever that is. Sure. That? Well, and here's here's where what I'm trying to describe, and I don't know that I'll ever do a great job of it. But if you look at we'll call we'll call our reality if it were a celestial plane that the, our solar system is in, and all the stars are in it, the all of creation is in it. We can't just say that God is out here on the fringe just farther than our telescopes can see. Because that puts Him in creation. He can't just be far farther out, higher up, somewhere still, because our creation is still a limitation. The Creator cannot be in the creation. No more than Michelangelo could be in the Sistine Chapel, or Da Vinci could be in the Mona Lisa. Even, um, um, was that guy... Uh, Norman Rockwell, you've seen the calendars. He did a self-portrait of himself. That was not him. He was not in the creation. It just was a reflection of him. So God must not, cannot be just on the fringes of the created order because that would just push him farther and farther out into space within our creation. God must exist in a reality that is beyond our creation, which is just something contained in His reality. So, that's like infinity for God and well Yes. See, what... Because we what, can't even understand infinity. Oh, absolutely. None of us can. Um, but what, what we have a problem with is that we define everything by the dimensionality that we're associated with. If you go out into outer space, you still have height, 
and length and depth. So we understand we live in a, at least a three-dimensional reality, correct? Because this is a two-dimensional person. He may have height, he may have width, but he has no depth, correct? We're three-dimensional. Now I can tell you that we are actually four-dimensional. Stretch our brains just a little bit. Huh? Because we exist at a point in time. So you've got length, width, depth, and time. Uh, uh, an existence, a reality now. We exist in the now. That's the reason time travel seems so kind of absurd because if you exist in the now, do you exist in the future? Uh, I don't know. That's, uh, that makes your, that's the stuff that makes your brain want to explode. Do you exist in the past? Is there a past to exist in? But God recognized it and He even said it and there's something in the Scripture that we have to recognize when He said that I am not the God of the dead but of the living. When Jesus told the Pharisees before Abraham was, I am. So there is a dimension, there is a fourth, at least a fourth dimension of time. But these things that we look at were created for us. If God is eternal, then that means time does not exist for God. Right? That was for us. In the beginning of what? In the beginning of our created order. In the, create, in the beginning of this. But not in the beginning of God. This is one reason that I wonder if there's not been multiple situations. I don't, don't preach this or proclaim this. But who, if God has been around for eternity... Then he carves out 6,000 years and throws us out here and says, Here, this is going to be something great and spectacular. Is it beyond the possibility that God has done this before? He just didn't tell us about it. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. I'm just trying to stretch your mind. I am trying to stretch your mind into the, this next part because we're getting into something that we cannot and we do not have the right to bring it into our comprehension. We don't have a right to quantify it, to quantitate it, to make it, uh, uh, it's pull a ruler on its dimensions and make everything so that we can understand it because the Scripture is giving us a picture of something that we can't even imagine. And while there are numbers given and there is a new heaven and a new earth, the laws and the physics and the principles of it, we don't know that they will still apply. And I, I, I was just throwing that out there. I don't know. Maybe God... Anything's possible. The Bible says that Jesus was uh, the lamb slain from the foundation, not of eternity, but from the foundation of the world. From the beginning. From the begin you can't throw that into in, in eternity. There is no beginning in infinity. Do you see what, what I'm trying to get at? I believe that many well-meaning people have come up with scriptures and they've tried to create this nice box concept of eternity and heaven and the new creation and they've tried to make all the pieces fit together and ooh, make us a, a nice so our minds can comprehend it. If our minds can comprehend it, I don't believe it's heaven. That's the reason I... Let's, let's start here. Um, New Jerusalem. We'll, we'll, we'll get into this uh, right here. 
And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. We'll stop right there. There is a, the old heaven and the old earth are gone. Not just dusted off and cleaned up. Gone. Second Peter. No, yeah, Second Peter chapter three, verses twelve and thirteen talks about a, a the the elements dissolving with a fervent heat, a complete fire renovation of the earth. This is going to be that everything that we now know is gone and re recreated. Who are we to say that the same principles that God put in place now or that we exist in now because we now exist under a sin-cursed world and a sin-cursed creation, who are we to say that the same principles will apply then? We don't. The sky may be a different color. You know why our atmosphere, our sky looks the color it is? It's a reflection of the water. But there's no sea. Because there's no more sun. Yeah. Then where goes time? Time's gone. The sun is our dictation of time. Every principle that we now, every concept of mathematics and physics and biology is gone. Our biology right now, we have made, um, we, we make understandings of biology, our molecules and our atoms and our subatomic structures, everything that we look at in our modern, in our, our current culture, our current life, it all hinges on premises of living, growing old, and dying. That's gone. It's all based, Einstein's theory of relativity, based on time. Speed of light. Speed of light from where? From the sun. They've already proven that the speed of light is not necessarily constant in the universe anymore. So we see that the very principles that we have, if God made this creation and He set principles in place, does He not also have the right to destroy them? And if he destroys the heavens and the earth and creates brand new ones, does that mean that the principles that we now understand will be the same then? I don't believe it to be true. And I've read, huh? Temperature. temperature? What is temperature? Our temperature is based on our proximity or our, uh, our proximity or distance from the sun. Gravity, spin of the earth, gravitational pull, our tides. All that based on the moon. There's no more sea. That's going to... If the principles that we have in the new heaven and new earth... No. If the principles we have now are carried over into the new heaven and the new earth, life would not be possible. Because we now are sustained by certain things that God put into place to keep life on this little rock of a, a possible possibility. But when all that, you throw away the ocean, you have just destroyed our ecosystem. If our oceans were to dry up today, we would all die. You do realize that, right? But if there's no more sea and there's no more sun, the principles have got to be different. I've read, I've read and I've studied and I was listening to somebody. Well, this can't be the, the new Jerusalem comes down and the size of it and everything that is made. Well, it can't be literal. It's got to be allegorical. It's got to be uh, talking in poetic terms because if it was as large as they say it's going to be, then it would no, in no way fit on the earth. Who said the earth's going to be the same size? And it very well may be. It may be that there is some supposition, somebody once uh, uh, supposed that there was no sea in the very beginning because of the water coming up as a mist that watered the earth. 
you, we know that the oceans right now create, through evaporation, create rain. There's been some who will argue that there is no, there was no rain at that time. I don't know it to be true. I'm just simply saying that there's some people, and they actually have stated that the earth, if it was all flattened out, if you took a rolling pin to the world and flattened it all back out, there wouldn't be room for a sea. The reason the oceans exist now is because of the runoff from the flood as the plates pushed up mountains and created valleys. Our earth may have under, I believe our earth has undergone massive renovation by Noah's flood. It's not the same planet that God created in the beginning as far as physical structure. I do know that the Bible says that on uh, uh, one of the days of creation that God created great whales. And so I believe that there probably was at least large bodies of water, whether they were salt, whether they were oceans, I don't know. But again, there's where we get into speculation. I can't go back there and see. I can't go up into the future and see. I'm limited. And God is trying to give a finite creature a glimpse of infinity. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. Praise God. What we're seeing here and we're studying, and it really boggles our mind, that, wow, God's going to make a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. It is no more amazing than God making a brand new soul. A brand new spirit out of somebody who was once dead and is brought to life in salvation. Being born again. I, I can't remember. I wrote it down somewhere. I believe it was Voltaire. But I can't remember for sure. But he said something to the effect. Being born the first time is such a miracle that why should it surprise us being born again? I don't know who it was that said it. I, it was one of, them, uh, one of them great thinkers. But God making something brand new, we think, wow, He's going to make a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. He's been making things new for a long time. And I don't think we give it the proper respect. I don't, think it, I don't think it boggles our, our mind. I don't think it makes us as joyful as it should. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. The word New Jerusalem only appears twice in Scripture, although it's alluded to multiple times in Scripture. And those, both of those appearances are in Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 21, I believe. No, verse 12, Revelation 3 and 12, when he talks to the church of Philadelphia, they will be given a new name and they will be given the ability to live in God's new Jerusalem. And then here in the new Jerusalem comes, uh, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We see this. <clears throat> there is probably not a time where a woman will be as immaculately dressed as at her wedding at least folks I know um, we're not into the grand ball scene I don't know about y'all but I have not been invited to a palace recently um, and I will more than likely the only other time I'll ever get as dressed up as I was at my uh, my wedding will be either the wedding of my daughter or my death. And even then, I would prefer not to put any real expense into something going into the dirt. Um, at my wedding, I wore something that I don't... I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a tuxedo guy. Um... I'm just not. I'm I'm a I'm a, a blue jeans guy. I like, uh, <laughs> but uh, 
when you picture you, you, the imagery here from this word as a as a bride adorned for her husband, I don't know what it is about. I, I no, Ty, I don't get involved in this, folks. Man, I've seen some wedding dresses are starting to look trashy. I don't know what it is. It is supposed to be a dignified and solemn ceremony. And I've seen women that are in wedding dresses that look like, hmm, it looks like harlotry. But in this time period, the woman would have dressed to absolute, it would have been a dazzling uh, spectac uh, spectacular uh, um, image. This is what God's trying to create with this picture as a bride for her husband. So what you see is all the uh, ornament, all the jewelry, everything that would have made her look appealing and tantalizing. That's what, uh, that's what uh, the holy uh, city, New Jerusalem, looks like adorned for her husband. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That right there ought to give us a moment to just stop and bask in the glow of the fact that one day God will live with us. Right now, we feel God's presence, and that seems to be almost more than many people can handle. When you think about it, when the Holy Ghost begins to move, the Holy Spirit begins to move, when we exhibit or demonstrate as Pentecostals the presence of God in our lives, that is overflow. Which means we can't even contain it. We can't contain that presence. We cannot contain Him in our life. Just Him being in present in proximity to us almost overwhelms us. The Bible says that Moses just saw a glimpse of God's back as God passed by. Took His hand away. The people had to make Him put a bag over His head because they couldn't stand the glow of His own features. When he went in to talk with God, he took the veil off. When he came out to talk to people, he glowed in the dark. He had put a veil over his head because nobody wanted to see the glory of God that shone from his body. We cannot, we cannot endure that kind of intimacy with God. Don't tell me that sin hasn't broken something. Because Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. We don't know what that looked like. We don't understand it. Because we've never been that close. Even saved, we're not that close. Even sanctified, even baptized with the Holy Ghost. Our flesh is still weak. It is still finite. This flesh is still corrupt. And so we cannot even begin to understand the kind of intimacy that God will have with His people at this time when the new Jerusalem comes down. The word tabernacled means to dwell among or dwell with as if tabernacling will be living in your home. We look at a tabernacle as a place, but the word tabernacle cannot actually be like a verb as in being in that proximity. And God will tabernacle or dwell with us. And He will dwell with them and they shall be His people and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Here's the scripture. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. This is, a, this is the first statement that we have. The millennial, the millennial reign, the millennial reign of Christ, the millennium, there is still pain, there's still suffering, there is still death. People want to equate this with heaven. This is not heaven. This is an intermediary. This is an intermediate time period. That all, this, all this from this point back has to be done away with. Everything has got to change. If there's still sin, then there will be death. If there is still sin, there will be suffering. If there is still death, or if there is still sin, there will be tears. They'll all be there. 
Sin has got to be ultimately, finally, and completely eradicated for this to move forward where there's no more tears, no more death, no more uh, crying, no sorrow, no more pain, no more torment. All that's got to go away. When God says that the former things are passed away, we look at that and we go, ooh, that means He took care of the world. That means everything, everything is gone. Yeah, uh, that's, that's good. It's the end of the world as we know it. Everything that we once knew has got to be gone. Now, what does that mean for us? I don't know. Does that mean our memories are gone? I don't know. See, my mind thinks that if I can still remember individuals, I will recognize that there are certain individuals that didn't make it, and I will be saddened by that. But our emotions will have changed. What does that look like? What's that going to be like? I don't know. It's like trying to get a, uh, a West Virginia hillbilly to describe Paris. I've never been there. I don't know. But here we are, we're looking at it from a viewpoint of being finite, and none of us have a frame of reference. None of us. You can build heaven in your mind however you want to, and you'll still be wrong. <laughs> right. You, no, you can't. You cannot even begin to uh, bring to mind how all this fits together. And I believe that God, by giving us some of these words, only... I think some people get hung up on those. Streets of gold. If you went, if somebody paid for you to go to Hawaii, Anybody here, here want to go to Hawaii? I don't know. Everybody says they want to go to Hawaii. I, me personally, eh, whatever. But say you, wherever it is in your, in, your, in your imagination on this planet that you would like to go. When you get there, are you going to stop and say, Ooh, look at the road. Well, I can go home now. I've seen the road. No, you're, you're there to see more. You're there. For, what God told us about the building materials is so small in comparison to the other stuff that you're really going to be there to see. <laughs> the streets of gold is so small, but to us it's so big. All right. And he that sat upon the throne, which would be? Jesus. God has given him the throne. And again, we're still in uh, supposition. We're still in speculation. How does a triune God give throne to his son? How can there be a son when you're a trinity that you're uh, equal... Folks, we take a lot of stuff for granted and we get a lot of people with big words and we get a lot of people with multiple degrees and they talk like they've got it all under control and we haven't even got an understanding of what the Trinity is, okay? There's not one uh, illustration, one illusion that allows us to understand even the Trinity. says, Upon the throne, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. All of time. Can be seen. All of time. Not eternity. All of time. Can be seen as a large circle. From creation 
to culmination. See, what happened in creation, we fell. Right after creation, it was good. That was the way God wanted it. That's the way God made it. He made it good. He made it very good. And He put man on it, and He was very happy with His creation just as He made it. But we fell. Because God gave the opportunity for man to sin. And man took him at it, and he sinned. And from that point forward, God has been working to bring everything back to the way He intended it to be. The plan of redemption was not simply to make us good in our sins, but to deliver us from our sins. Redemption was God bringing us back to perfection. And at this point, Jesus Christ makes a statement. On the cross, He said, it is finished. What is finished? The plan of salvation. It was all worked out. Nothing had to be added to it. Not Pentecost... Pentecost was added for us, but Pentecost was not necessary for salvation. There are people I've heard that would say that if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're not going in the rapture. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. The plan of salvation was done. Not another thing had to be added to it. The baptism of the Holy Ghost was that surety, that, that uh, down payment on what would be coming later. And it was the boldness and the power necessary for us to reach out to this world and do the things that God expected us to do. Having the baptism of the Holy Ghost does not make you one dot more saved. You're either saved or you're not. You're not more saved. Do I believe that we should have or should seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Yes. I believe we go about it all wrong. I believe we beg and beg and beg God to baptize with the Holy Ghost. And there's not one, no, not one portion of the Scripture where anybody begged for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Not one. The problem is not the Holy Ghost wanting or not wanting to baptize individuals. The problem's us. We beg God like He's just dangling it out there. No, you're not going to get it. You can't have the baptism. You can't. Have God wants to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. We say we do. We want to be baptized, but truly, deep down, most of us don't. And that's what withholds. That's where the problem lies. I'm not online anyway. Hmm. There are some messages that are for the edification of the church and they require an interpretation, otherwise we don't know what is said. There's sometimes that you simply praise God and you speak to the Lord singularly, a singular conversation. There are groanings that cannot be uttered by the Holy Ghost. That doesn't come with an interpretation because God knows what's being said. In a situation like what you're saying, um, people do pray in tongues, people sing in tongues, I've heard it. People praise God in tongues and it was not an, a message for the entire congregation. It was for that heart, that spirit to God Himself. If it is for edification of the entire church though, Paul says that we must pray that there is an interpretation. That way it can edify everybody. So yes. But when, we look in, when we're looking at this, the Holy Ghost... The, the scripture here says it is done. What is done? All that God started off to accomplish. He brought it all back to Himself. He brought all of creation back to Himself. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. We see this in Revelation chapter 1. God you know, that Jesus refers to Himself as such. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the ending. It all hinges on Christ. 
the Ten Commandments, Christ. I'm in the, the painfully repetitive and um, involved in depth of the, the sacrifices in Leviticus, the Levitical wall. In my, in my Bible reading. I'm, and you go, oh my goodness. You've got two turtle doves, you've got a pigeon, you've got, uh, 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 you got this goat, and you've got this sheep, and you've got this ram, and you've got this uh, oil, and you've got this, and you're going, man, that make my head spin. It's not about the laws, it's not about those sacrifices, it's not about the legalities, it's not about the Aaronic priesthood, it's not about the tabernacle, it's all about Jesus Christ. The very beginning, the very ending, it's all about Christ. From the very beginning, God knew that His Son would have to redeem mankind. He knew that this point, when Jesus would say, it is done, He knew that it would all be about Christ. And He had to get us on board. He had to bring us to that. Why is it that the whole Old Testament, because we're so hard-headed and thick-skulled, that we wouldn't have got it any other way? If Jesus Christ had been the first person that was bo the first child born to Adam and Eve, that we would have still missed it all. He had to teach us how sinful our sins were. He had to show us that we had no hope apart from God Himself. He had to show us His holiness. Or we would have took him completely for granted. I am Alpha and Omega. Huh? Somebody say something? No. The beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the, wa of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake, of, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. No body who sins will make it to heaven. I am so tired of us trying to preach people into glory. If they were, a, if they were lost, they stayed lost. There's no purgatory. They are, if, they're, if they rejected Christ, they went to hell. If you don't know, then don't touch it. Just preach Jesus to the people that are still alive. But what we want to do is we want to make everybody feel, help, uh, feel hopeful that their loved one went to heaven. They're in a better place. We know where they went. Let me tell you something. Apart from the mercy of God, there are some people... Apart from the mercy of God, every one of us will be in hell. But unless they made a confession on their deathbed and only, but only God and them know, there's people that I know that, I hate to say it, but they have inherited the second death that they worked for. There's no other way. If we believe that everybody goes to heaven, then the work of Christ is of no consequence. It's not needed. If we, if we throw to a universalist idea that everybody gets to go to heaven, that not, then every, the many of the words that Jesus spoke, they don't mean nothing. Which means that Jesus was a liar. Which if Jesus was a liar, then that means that he, how can He save anybody? God, Jesus here says that those people who sin will not inherit eternal life. We're getting into what eternal life looks like. They can't have it. People don't like to think in terms of dichotomies. They don't like to think in terms of one or the other. They, don't, they want the gray. They want to be able to tomcat around with none of the consequences of STDs or unwanted pregnancies. Hello? They don't want... To the, the, they want to party without the possibility of being in a drunk driving accident or whatever. They want, they want to marry, but they don't want to be tied down. 
So we've got all sorts and all manner of things to rid people of their consequences for their actions. But if you read and study the Scripture, there is very little gray. We're living in a world right now where most preachers are preaching a lot of gray. Grace. It's grace. Let me tell you something. There are still black and whites in the Scripture, and that is that if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are lost. Or blemish. That's exactly right. So that, bride, uh, that bride, when she was at dawn, it was showed her purity. And she has made herself clean. Through what? Through the blood of the Lamb. They, she has made herself clean. She is not only, not just physically a clean, but what we're talking about is a ceremonially clean or ceremonially pure. Not that we are by any means better than anybody else. But that salvation experience is necessary. It is a requirement to uh, receive eternal life. And we can't play both sides of the fence. There are people who are wanting to, uh, they wanting to be saved, but they're still wanting to stroke sin, and you can't do both. Jesus said, if you love me, You'll just do whatever you want to do and I'll make sure that everything works out. We, no, He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In the epistles it says, Come out of her, my children, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Come out from among the abominations of this world. We have got such a, a lackadaisical understanding of how we're supposed to approach holiness. I know that I cannot be holy enough. I know that I cannot dress holy enough. I know I can't listen to the music enough to be holy or read the Bible enough to be holy. I know all that. It's not a pharisaical, puritanical, or self-righteousness. But I have to do as much as I can because it keeps me walking where I'm supposed to walk. Let me tell you, I can't listen to enough godly music to make me holy, but I can listen to enough ungodly music to ensure that I will be unholy. I can go, I can't go to enough right places to make to make me holy, but I can go to enough wrong places to assure that I will be unholy. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? These individuals, they are lost. And we, as the church, as the church corporate, not this church, but the church globally, the church worldwide, the church from time, throughout time, we have taken God's holiness and I guess because we've determined we can't achieve it, we've just thrown it out. We've quit trying. And what people have said, oh, well, if you... Preach a clothesline, then you just self-righteous hypocrite. Let me tell you something. There is still a certain thing called modesty. Does it look different throughout time? Probably. Does it look different across cultures? Probably. But that doesn't mean that it's not something that we should aspire to and strive for. Do you not believe that the Holy Ghost can lead us into these things?
And I mentioned this in the previous service, that the Spirit of God, the presence of Jesus Christ, the presence of the Holy Ghost in your life produces change. It will always produce transformation. If you are the exact same person you were before you had your salvation experience, then you weren't saved. Well, that's a judgmental statement. I can, I can say with all surety that if you, have not, if you have passed from death unto life, you will be different. Something will be different. Do you follow me? I'm not saying that you'll have not have any problems, that if you smoked before, you won't smoke after. If you had a dirty mouth before, you won't have a dirty mouth after. But I will tell you, something will have changed and God will be working on you. Period. And if God is not working on you and you are not beginning to produce fruit in your life, you are not saved. No, we cannot justify ourselves. That's right. And so a person, these individuals, this, these are blanket statements, fearful or fear-causing. Unbelieving. Abominable. Those who, have, who work things that are uh, basically disgusting in God's sight. Murderers. God, Jesus told us who murderers were, and those were people that just hated their brother without a cause. Whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Well, a sorcerer is a, a, a wizard or a witch. Um, and that has a lot of implications, but it has the, quite uh, practically, it is one who uh, manipulates and intimidates. To get people to fo follow their line of thinking. That covers a lot of people. Idolaters, anybody who puts something before God. See, God's not playing with this stuff, folks. All liars. You can be good in everything else. If you're a liar, you're going to hell. That's just the way it is. And that's not saying that a Christian who is told a lie is going to hell. I'm, what I'm saying is a liar. A liar is one who habitually and continually and purposefully lies Regularly. It's just their, their nature. If you are... I believe it's very obvious. Satan is called the father of lies. And Jesus said, I am the truth. If you speak, after, if you speak lies, you speak after your father. If you speak truth, you speak after your father. And that's the way I look at it. You're going to have a family resemblance. I believe that all our sins need to be repented of and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I will say this. I used to be uh, extremely um, hard about that as well, and it left me with absolutely no peace about my life. What if I did something and died before I had a chance to get it uh, repented of? My question is, somewhere in there has to fall grace. Somewhere in there has to fall grace. Has to. Grace has got to be there. And grace is bigger than we think. But I don't want to play with it. I don't want to test it. How far is too far? I don't know, but I don't want to get there. How, far, how close is too close? I don't know, but I don't want to test the limits. 
I don't want to push the envelope. I don't want to test the boundaries. I want to be as close to Jesus Christ as I can be because I know that I still always have room to get closer. But if I'm really close, He's not going to leave me. Yes. If someone's there and you say they're not, it's a lie. If you use, I've heard people say, well, this is business, and you say little things. Or, Folks, business is just a reflection of what's going on in your heart. I don't believe that I have to tell everything I know. Huh? I guard my tongue. I don't have to. I don't have to just blabber all everything I know. There's sometimes I need to be discreet, but at the same time, I don't have a right to lie. Never. Fearful and unbelie- unbelieving in the abominable, and we might get onto that one time. Sister, because there's people have a real hard time with this whole thing about lying. I've heard people say that if you don't tell everything, if you don't tell everything you know, then you're still lying. Hmm. I don't think that's true. Yeah. And sometimes things are our opinion. Somebody says, do you, uh, do you like this dress? No. Do you like these shoes? No. <laughs> what good would that do? Hurt somebody's feelings. If you like it. I've said stuff like that. If you like it. Well, well did you lie by omission? No. That's my opinion. Anyway, we're going to move on. I'm going to... It's guarding our tongue, yes. We've got to be very careful. I kind of, I guess I chased a rabbit there, but anyway, we come back. Um, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. All right. It's after, after eight. We're going to... Uh, Dismiss. I want to get started next uh, Wednesday, Lord willing, on the actual um, description. And there is a physical, and I believe it to be a physical description, whether or not we understand all of it, I believe it to be a physical, literal description of the New Jerusalem. And that's a good possibility. I hadn't thought of that possibility that we may have creatures beyond horses and dogs and cats and guinea pigs and parakeets and rabbits. No, there will not be any goats. The sheep have been separated from the goats and the goats had their place in the lake of fire. See, no goats in in eternity. Why in the world would anybody want to show a goat? <laughs> there, must be, there must have been at least 30 different breeds of goats there. It is amazing. Amazing. And they grow them for different reasons. Some were meat, but some had hair, some had fur, some, you know, it was just amazing. The only goats that I've ever seen that I got any enjoyment. I, now, I have seen them little itty bitty goats. Yeah. I guess they're cute, but they wouldn't be cute for long, and I'd. Of them. I've had a goat in here before. You've had a goat in here? In here, yes. Uh, Our pastor raised goats and he uh, Bless him. He named all the goats after children uh, in the church, so he ran out of children and names. Uh, but we did the blood is still there, and we used a little goat as uh, the lamb. 
mm. the little boy home, the little goat. And I kept him up there at the Sunday school room in a box. You could tell he was 11 at the beginning. Mm. <laughs> but that's just a bit of trivia. Yeah, I got no. I got. I ain't got no use for no goat, but um, <laughs> but um, we're going to get into the actual dimensions of the New Jerusalem, um, some of the things that we can expect to find there, even though we may not find, uh, I, I, I know that there was a, a lady in church one time that said, uh, there'll be no dogs in heaven because all, the do all dogs are without the city. There's a verse in the Bible that says all dogs are without the city, outside. So, uh, well, I, be happy with their uh, I don't. I don't. I was. I, I just. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> it is hard to let go of what we're familiar with because that's our only point of reference. That's all we know. But we must learn even now to trust God. We trust Him with the things we know. We're going to have to trust Him with the things that we don't know, the things that we don't understand. The things, Because, folks, when you get to that point where you're about to pass, uh, pass away from this life and into the life to come, you're not driving. There ain't a thing that you can do. If you don't have Jesus Christ waiting for you on the other side when this, when this body quits, and He collects your spirit. Folks, you, you will be completely... You're not in control of that. He has to be, he has to be there to take care of that situation. Um, so, any other questions? Did I make any sense in my ramblings? I'm, I think I'm getting worse. Last Wednesday was a rambling Wednesday, and this Wednesday seemed to ramble some. I don't know what it is. I'm studying, but it's just, maybe I'm just getting tired. <laughs> getting deep. Maybe I'm drowning. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hmm. No. I, I believe that to be true. Well, that's a good question. And we don't know what that heaven... See, the thing about heavens, the heavens can be multiple things. Our English language does not cover, and I believe me and you have been in that conversation. The English language does not well cover the terms hell nor heaven. Paul actually had to give us an indication that he was called up to the third heaven. That there are multiple understandings our English language does not well quantify. Um, the heavens that the Bible talks about in creation, there's a heavens that was where the birds fly, heavens below and above the firmament, whatever that was. There's a second heaven. What is that? We assume it to be the place of stars or outer space. The third heaven is something that is otherworldly. It is other is outside of creation. It's the abode of God. But if God creates a new heavens and a new earth, it could very well be that the third heaven no longer exists. That He now exists with man. And the heavens that He creates is... A celestial plane, but it could, but it would still have to be completely other than what we have, because it would be a creation that God lives in. And how can God? God even said He could not live in uh, uh, temples made of hands or houses made of hand, by hands. So God can't be limited by creation. So it still has to be an infinite creation in which God lives with us. And, then, and again, that just boggles our mind because where's our point of reference? Where's our frame for this? Well, 
And we're not... And who is to say that we're not able to pass from one to the other at will? Jesus Christ, when He ascended, He didn't just fly up into the sky. He ascended off of this planet, but where did He go? Does that, see, ascension is more than just ooh, and going up into a cloud. He did that for the people's benefit. But where did He go? Do you, rem- do you understand the amount of thrust necessary for a space shuttle to lift off of this planet and to achieve orbit? The heat that's generated to just get out of our atmosphere. And Jesus just ascends up and a cloud receives Him and it makes for a nice pretty sound. But there's a lot more that was going on there. The dynamics, the, the logistics of it. That was just nice wording. But Jesus ascended and then went beyond creation. I guess where I'm getting animated and passionate is that it just... Ah! makes your mind go, wow! We can't just put everything nice and neat in the little box and say, there's Jesus. He shows up at the right hand of the Father. He, at, but before He ever ascends, He passes through walls, but still has, a di- has dinner. How do you eat something and then walk through a wall? Or just disappear. We don't know. See, there's a whole nother reality here, and a whole nother thing that we can't just and I could I could just do, well, you know, Jerusalem is big, New Jerusalem, and it just sits down here on the earth and everything's just peachy and we just go on into eternity and that's where we leave it. But the deep things of God I think are worth exploring if nothing else but to show us how small we are, how big He is and He's got a great big plan that we're not even aware of. We can't even get our mind around it. I believe that so much has been just kind of dropped and said, well, here it is. Since we don't understand it, we don't play with it. than the tribulation. Yes, much better news than the tribulation. But, all of it is necessary. It's all necessary. None of it was necessary. We did make it through our sin and our failure. It became a requirement for the, the completion of the redemptive process. Thank you, Sister Georgine. That was a deep question. And, 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 and again, a lot of these questions could be answered, don't know, but they're fun, to, they're fun to explore. They're really fun to get in these conversations and just, it would be nice to just have coffee and donuts and just sit around and go, hey, have you thought of this? And you go, well, no, that couldn't really work. Oh, okay. But it, it's just fun to think about what all God's going to do because He's told us a little bit and then said, but eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither is entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Alright. I will try to refrain from the realm of the bizarre. I will try to refrain from the realm of the bazaar. But I love it. I think it's so much fun. <laughs> if everybody will, let's stand. We'll be dismissed before I, I pop, a, pop a string. Before we, I let you go, have I just completely ruined everybody's understanding of what we're going into because I am really, I know that some of this stuff is not what many would consider orthodox teaching. This is, I think we've left the realm of orthodoxy. 
orthodoxies are the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots. No. But it's it blessed are you that read this book. So I believe it goes on beyond being a newborn Christian. It's when you want to know of the mysteries of God and the things. I agree. And sh were we taught? Were we teaching a, uh, a, a teenage class or a new a bunch of new Christians? Y'all have been Christians a long time, and I figure that at this point. We can handle this. Sure. Well, it should be new. It should be exciting. It should be fresh. It should be new. Um, Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. It's been here forever, but people are like, hmm. Well, y'all may think I'm, I've lost my marbles. I thought I'd lost my glory here now. It wasn't until God gets you all right. Listen to this. No, you know, it's all right. It's a little bit left. But, uh, you know. I, I, I may I may be off my cabbage, but you know, think about this. There's nothing wrong with us trying to figure out, toying with possibilities, as long as we don't become sacrilegious. I think that it's great for us to try to figure certain aspects out, understandings, trying to understand what God is doing. We're not going to get it all right, but what good is Having the Bible and just rereading the same thing over and over and over. Just try to squeeze something out of it, right? Lord, we thank you for this time that we could be in your house. We thank you for your grace and we thank you for your mercy. Lord, we don't even begin to scratch the surface of the things that you've prepared for us. We don't have any clue what it's all going to look like, what it's all going to be like, and even our wildest imaginations will be so far from any reality that it could be. But Lord, I pray that as we study your word, as we look into your word, we know that your word is eternally settled. We know that heaven and earth will pass away, but your, your word will stand forever. And Lord, as we look into it, into that anointed word, I pray, Lord, that it will stir, it will invigorate, it will, it will enlighten, but it will also bring a passion and a fire into our hearts for a desire for something that's greater than any vacation that we could ever take, something